so our topic today is uh, starts with a question mark uh, because uh, it is actually debated hotly whether there's such a thing as populist constitutionalism. You heard uh, some of that during the lecture of, of Blocker and Halmai, uh, except that they did not really sharpen the, the debate very much as I would have, of course, had I been on one of the sides. Uh, there are more polite European people who, who are friends personally, and so they didn't, <laughs> they didn't sharpen the antagonism. But of course, if somebody like Halmai, along with Jan Werner Müller, calls populist constitutionalism an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms, and if someone like uh, Paul Blocker uh, uh, spends the effort to actually show that there really is populist constitutionalism, then there is a fairly sharp debate between them that you can reconstruct in terms of the reading for this class. I'm not gonna go to the reading, except refer to them as I go along uh, necessarily. But I think that the debate, of course, uh, 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 we first have to settle the question, not just what populism is, and I have very serious disagreements with Halmari about that question, which I expressed perhaps a little bit impolitely a couple of times when he spoke about good and bad populism, which I, I just didn't like at all. Uh, but I've never been a fan, I never was a fan of Isaiah Berlin, I have to admit. So he invented that distinction. And so I am by, by nature critical of it. Anyway, so I don't like Halmer's uh, definition, but I do agree with him on the question of constitutionalism. What is constitutionalism? I mean, obviously, the term could be used for lots of things, and uh, and there are people who even edit volumes, like my other friend Günter Frankenberg in Germany, called authoritarian constitutionalism. It's not quite an oxymoron. Okay, so we were talking about is there populist constitutionalism, and I began to introduce Karl Levinstein's three-part uh, idea uh, of. Uh, uh, of semantic nominal normative constitution. Uh, semantic constitution, as Barbara, but she's not here today, and Joanna know, are likely typical Soviet type constitutions, uh, which paper over uh, the actual political arrangements very uh, uh, dramatically. The, uh, the Communist Party is almost never mentioned in them uh, as an institution. This begins in in already 1918. Uh, that's what Livingstein means. Uh, uh, he means uh, uh, nominal constitutions uh, uh, are different than that, according to him, because they are power maps that indicate the actual structure of power without, however, providing means of holding the power holders uh, uh, to their uh, uh, delegated, uh, uh, delegated authority. Uh, and finally, nom uh, normative constitutions are constitutions which are uh, at least in significant part enforced even against the power holders themselves. Uh, when you have that particular, when you have these three, you already can see that the issue of relationship to a constitution is itself a spectrum. Moreover, within nominal constitutions, you can have a question of degree, uh, you know, how much are the power holders uh, held on, uh, held uh, to uh, their jurisdiction or their form of authority? Uh, uh, there are nominal constitutions where uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the apex of the legal pyramid is not held to its rules at all and cannot ever be held to it. Donald Trump imagined that he was the apex of such a legal system, as of course you all know wrongly. Uh, and empirically incorrectly, given uh, 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 the uh, ability of other branches to enforce at least the law some of the time uh, against him. And they could have done it all the time had they wished by, for example, impeaching him. In any case, some nominal constitutions uh, 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 involve an extensive uh, 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 set of, uh, of limits uh, 
including even uh, the high domains of power and some nominal constitutions do not. It is this that allows us to see the question as a spectrum, a spectrum of possibilities. If you had only semantic and normative constitutions, then it would be an either or matter. Either you have constitutionalism or not. But this addition of nominal allows one to think of, that's why Günter Frankenberg's book makes sense. But the question is where populist constitutionalism uh, fits in. Uh, those who feel that there is such a thing, like uh, Paul Blocker, whose essay I think is especially good uh, in the volume, uh, distinguish uh, between several models. One way of distinguishing is between liberal, republican, and democratic models of constitutionalism. Uh, uh, Blocker tends to focus on another distinction between the legal and the political. Is the constitution simply a set of uh, legal uh, provisions enforced uh, almost exclusively by courts, or is it something that is uh, enforced also uh, by, uh, by political actors, uh, uh, other branches of power, for example, uh, federalism, or also to some extent the units of the federal system, and even the population and the press uh, have a significant role in this more political model. Uh, liber uh, for sake of simplicity, liberal models uh, can easily be identified with, uh, with the legal, with legal constitutionalism. Republican and democratic models uh, uh, have at least uh, a dimension of political uh, constitutionalism. In the argument of Hannah Arendt, which is recently repeated by Jeremy Waldron, uh, uh, Republican and democratic models end power as well as limit. Uh, and, uh, and I think that is an important distinction, except that it leaves uh, one, uh, uh, one question uh, uh, still open, namely, can you empower without limiting? In other words, can branches of government be empowered without other branches being limited? How can you empower Congress if you don't limit the president, right? That empowerment would be a sham as sometimes in Latin American countries, Fujimori, for example, uh, under Fujimori in Peru, uh, people found out. Uh, so, uh, so we, have to imagine that empowering and limitation go together. Stephen Holmes in an old article, which was published in a volume by Elster uh, and probably published elsewhere too, uh, Stephen Holmes speaks therefore of also empowering limits. There are limits that have no other thing than to limit uh, all branches of government, but there are also limits that empower others. Uh, the freedom of the press, for example, might limit Congress in terms of the US First Amendment, but it empowers the press, which could be easily understood informally as a branch of government, a fourth branch. And the electorate is empowered uh, uh, also, uh, obviously, through, uh, uh, through certain kinds of, 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 of limitations. Uh, the question therefore is, uh, uh, can you imagine a purely political constitutionalism which does not have limitation also within it? In other words, which does not have also a liberal component. And here I agree with Halmay and Miller uh, who think that a constitution that has no liberal dimension, in other words, illiberal democracy to use Viktor Orban's term, uh, can't be really constitutionalist. I'll t I talk about Hungary separately in just a second. This is going to be weird. I'm holding my iPad, which is uncomfortable. Uh, of course, it also takes a photo of my ceiling. Uh, uh, it's kind of weird today. But this is, this, is what, this is what we have. And as long as you can hear me, I don't care. Uh, OK, so there is a liberal uh, dimension. But the liberal dimension, obviously, can be criticized. If, if, it is, if a constitution has a liberal dimension, uh, 
from a Republican and Democratic point of view, you can criticize it. There are indeed democratic critiques of juristocracy when uh, a gentleman named Lambert in the 19th century wrote a French book called Gouvernement des Juges. I don't know if there are French readers here and I don't think there's an English, although I would suspect given translations that there's a Spanish translation of it somewhere, uh, maybe not an English one, but no, there is no English one. There could be a German one for all I know. Gouvernement de juges, the government of judges, that's the first juristocracy thesis. He was not a populist. And indeed, he was a Frenchman who was writing about the United States. He was critical of a country in which the judges can uh, uh, so glibly, this is now the 19th century, uh, suppress uh, uh, the democratic will of the elected, elected branches. So the critique of uh, uh, juristocracy, and today I would say also what I call frozen constitutions, is something that has been uh, generated from liberal, from democratic uh, and republican perspectives, and indeed a liberal can share those critiques. By frozen constitutions, I mean a constitution whose amendment structure is such that almost no changes to the constitution can be made. And the U.S. Constitution, as you look at it, the Electoral College, uh, uh, an absurd institution uh, today, and indeed the uh, the ability of the states to control their electorate and thereby uh, exclude people uh, from uh, the franchise are uh, difficult to change because of the nature of, of the U.S. constitutional system. Uh, so these criticisms can be made from non-populist point of view, but populists nonetheless can piggyback on these criticisms. They can use these criticisms uh, I remember I distinguished between the, the movement and the governmental phase of populism, and in a movement phase, especially uh, a critical uh, relationship to what exists, uh, uh, also in the domain of constitutionalism, uh, can uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, be adopted uh, by populists. And indeed, they can renew this when they're attacked, even in government, because they can say, oh, yeah, we don't let the judges do whatever they want, like in some other country, but that's because we see that that leads to uh, to juristocracy or frozen frozen constitutionalism. But is populist constitutionalism only a critique of liberal frozen constitutionalism? Right. Uh, to its credit, uh, here I agree with Paul Blocker. He demonstrates uh, no. It can be more than just that. I have three things on the board that you see in front of you, uh, which uh, could lend content uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to populist constitutionalism, following two French authors, Maney and Sorel. I think they do have an English translation of their volume, but I don't have it in front of me here, so I can't tell you their title. Following them, I speak of a rebalanced constitutionalism I'll return to this in just a second. Well, it's a balance, just to, so you understand what I, what I mean. Uh, uh, the balance in question for them is between popular sovereignty and constitutionalism. And in their view, uh, many constitutions uh, uh, have shifted uh, from, uh, from uh, their stress on popular sovereignty to a stress on constitutionalism. In their minds, the US Constitution is one that has done this. And they also think of European constitutionalism, uh, where popular sovereignty is very weak, uh, to have shifted not the individual European countries now, but in the European, European uh, Union. So populist constitutionalism would mean rebalancing these two, uh, these two uh, uh, components. This is not unrelated to uh, the political constitutionalism that is stressed by Paul Blocker in his essay. He's following, of course, uh, many other authors, Bellamy, uh, to some extent Waldron. Uh, uh, the antagonist is legal constitutionalism. This too is a kind of rebalancing if you want to look at it that way. Uh, in all constitutionalisms, there is a political and a legal dimension 
I would say, I don't know if the populace would agree with me. Uh, and we could say from a democratic point of view that the balance has gone too far in the direction of illegal. So political constitution can be understood as a form of rebalancing too. I guess that's relevant to the third weak constitutionalism. I don't know anybody here has read Joel Colon Rios's Weak Constitutionalism, a very nice book, which focuses on Latin America. He's a professor in New Zealand, the poor guy, but he's from Puerto Rico. Uh, uh, and so he's a Latin Americanist. Now, New Zealand must be a wonderful place, uh, also in terms of its COVID policies, a woman prime minister who seems very, very uh, uh, attractive in many ways. I don't mean physically, but in terms of her politics. Uh, and uh, in any case, uh, uh, Colon Rios wrote a book called Reconstitutionalism, where he also has a kind of rebalancing in mind, but it is in terms of the constituent and constituted powers, which are not quite the same as the other two forms of rebalancing are involved. Uh, so uh, my question is then, uh, does populist constitutionalism stop with these three ideas of rebalancing? That's really the, the question for, for today's uh, class. And as I keep on reminding you, questions of this type uh, can, be, uh, 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 can be handled uh, on a logical level and on the empirical level. And to some extent, the debate between popular, those who think there is populist constitutionalism and those who think it's an oxymoron has to do with a shift between these two levels. But we here want to pay attention uh, to, uh, to both of these levels. So the first level is logical or rather logical linked to the definition of populism that we use here. Remember, we have stressed popular sovereignty, embodiment, part whole, friend enemy relations, and different definition of, uh, of uh, populism as the political or the foundational. Uh, you look at these things and you don't automatically uh, uh, will uh, uh, agree with me that on a logical level, there's a very big problem of linking populism and constitutionalism. But let's look at the terms just a little bit. This is also done by Paul Blocker in his essay with respect to some of these categories. And of course, is done by Katz Mudder in a piece. I think I assigned that to you as well. Of course, they are using their own definition. But all of them come up with the idea that there's going to be a problem for constitutionalism based on these definitions. For example, popular sovereignty. Now you could say uh, with Maney and Sorrell uh, that populism and constitutionalism are two poles of, uh, uh, of, of the democratic imaginary, which both emerge in the context of the battle against absolutism in the 18th century. It's empirically, of course, very correct. And you could say that uh, 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 in that sense, uh, uh, the only question is uh, their balance, which is their perspective, many and Sorrell's perspective. But what they omit, and Paul Blocker, to his credit, uh, concedes this, is that the populist notion of popular sovereignty is based on presence and embodiment. The popular sovereignty cannot just be, I keep on using this Latin uh, 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 reference, a deus absconditus, a hidden God, uh, as God was for, for St. Augustine. Uh, um, no, the popular sovereignty uh, must be not just real, but present. And presence can be achieved only by giving it some kind of body. That body in at least some theories not yet populist like that of the Abbe Sies is the assembly, the constituent assembly, which embodies popular sovereignty. 
But in populism, that body is almost always uh, 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 one that exists not only at a few great moments of history, like Hannah Arendt would say, uh, when, when a new constitution has to be created, it has to be there all the time. Uh, in any way, the CS theory easily leads to the deus absconditus because the constituent power uh, absorbs itself possibly in one interpretation in the constituted powers. This is a God that not only is hidden, but dies as I think in Indian mythology, sometimes the God dies and Greek too. Uh, it's an Indo old Indo-European idea probably, but it is revived at springtime, right? Uh, correct me if I'm <laughs> if representing anybody's tradition incorrectly. In any case, that is not the Judeo-Christian idea where God is eternal. Uh, but even there, it is not always present. So we want a God that doesn't periodically die and is always present. And that, for that, you need more than just a constituent assembly. It could be the regular legislature, but the regular legislature has the problem of division in democratic societies. And so embodiment in a single individual is a natural step to take because aside from uh, schizophrenia and other problems that sometimes leaders really have. Donald Trump is a great example of how psychologically screwed up a leader can be. Uh, uh, you know, you would not think of uh, of, uh, of of Jawaharlal Nehru as, as, as schizophrenic uh, or even Nelson Mandela. So some individuals and I think Viktor Orban on the populist side. Uh, uh, can be understood uh, to be uh, a person with a single will who uh, who's always uh, 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 aiming at the same uh, on the same sort of thing, the increase and defense of his own uh, own power in that particular case. So uh, uh, embodiment in a single individual. And once popular sovereignty to real presence and embodiment in a single individual, uh, 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 is reinterpreted, then constitutionalism is a real problem. I mean, if an individual is you or the people or the voice of the people, like Chavez liked to say, uh, my bad Spanish, uh, uh, yo soy Venezuela uh, or Trump, I am your voice, <laughs> I am your voice. When they say things like that, then the idea that an unelected court or even a legislature should veto or reject the people's voice. I mean, after all, uh, uh, they're there on behalf of the same people too, but they are not its voice. So constitutional limitations become a serious problem. And this becomes uh, also an issue uh, in relationship to the rights. If a part of the people uh, are the real people, then there ought to be a distinction between their roles in society. And that means that those who are not part of that part uh, should not have an equal citizenship to those who are the genuine people. You've seen this, for example, uh, I keep on returning to Soviet examples because I'm teaching the Russian revolution in an undergraduate class to the poor dears who are not uh, sufficiently interested, I have to tell you, in this unbelievably interesting history. Uh, you start with the Russian Revolution and the Soviet Constitution of uh, of nineteen uh, eighteen uh, uh, excludes anybody from the franchise who even hires labor kulaks, in other words, uh, in the terminology of the time. Uh, so, if a part of the genuine people, in that case, the toiling masses, as the Soviet Constitution then defined them, then the rest. Uh, are not, uh, their citizenship rights are irrelevant. And this is exacerbated by the friend enemy concept because then it's no longer just the citizenship rights, right? But the civil rights, you know, why should we give freedom of speech and freedom of press to our enemies? And the Bolsheviks act on this. Uh, I'm not suggesting uh, 
remember the distinction between the logical and the empirical that you can see every populist government do what the Bolsheviks did in the early 1920s or the fascists uh, from 1925 on in Italy uh, and so on. I'm not suggesting that their empirical I get that far, uh, but the logic uh, 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 goes in that direction. Uh, granted, uh, uh, a part of the logic, as Ernesto Laclau has uh, uh, told us, is that populism understands politics in terms of their political or their foundational. And shouldn't this interest uh, uh, link us to a kind of constitutionalism? I'll return to this next time, the constitutionalism of the constituent power. But I have to say in advance that the disinterest in politics and the exclusive stress on the political uh, means uh, that constitutional politics, uh, the originating politics, is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, made permanent. And under those conditions, uh, uh, constitutionalism, in terms of empowering different uh, branches, in terms of defending the rights of different people uh, becomes uh, 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 is put at the mercy of whoever at a, at a given moment is making uh, a new constitution. I mentioned the empirical cases. I just put them on the board. Uh, I think uh, somebody, a reader, I suspect it was Paul Taggart, liked this chapter of our book a lot. And I will share it with you because the cases are there. He thought it was especially useful the way uh, I deal with cases, uh, uh, not just the logical problems, but the cases themselves. You see, I, I talk about the National Front's proposal, Hungary, Turkey, Poland, and the Indian Republic, very briefly about Peron also. I'll just send you the piece so you can read it and see how I deal. Peru, I'm looking at Cesar. I have Peru in there as well. Uh, uh, linking Peru and Hungary, surprisingly enough, uh, uh, how would you do it? Well, because the executive plays such an important role in constitutional replacement in both of those, both of those cases. Anyway, I will send you the piece, all of you. And so I don't have to go through that part of the lecture in detail. Uh, let me just, however, uh, systematically, uh, a focus on uh, one uh, uh, aspect of this, namely the techniques. Uh, and these techniques uh, are, uh, uh, are used uh, uh, certainly against liberal constitutionalism in every single instance. The question is uh, whether uh, uh, they can lead to a new or a different kind of of, of constitutionalism. And that issue I will talk about both today a little and next time. I still have 20 minutes. So, so 10 minutes on the techniques and, and then 10 minutes on uh, why constitutionalism seems to survive empirically, not logically, empirically in populist settings. So the techniques. Well, Hungarians, there's no Hungarian today at present. Barbara, if she listens to the lecture, I mean you, uh, one technique is replacement. A Peruvian too will find this technique to be particularly relevant. And if anybody were here from, uh, from uh, Venezuela, uh, Ecuador or Bolivia, you would find this uh, also a relevant, uh, a relevant technique because in all these settings, constitutions were indeed replaced. In the essay I will send to you, the replacement can emerge from below a social movement seeking to replace an oligarchic constitution, or it can emerge from above as through our friend uh, Alberto Fujimori's autogolpe, right? Then it's certainly from above. He changed the rules for electing a constituent assembly. He got a much higher vote than in the previous election. I'm talking to Cesar who knows all this, but in any case, uh, uh, that's, what is, that's what is done by the executive is in charge. But in other settings, uh, uh, usually uh, uh, the Bolivian case is, point, is pointed out, uh, 
the movement for a new constitution can come from below because of the exclusion of part of the population, in that case, the indigenous. Uh, so replacement is one, one technique. No one here from Turkey, but you will know that uh, uh, if you have looked at uh, uh, the history of Mr. Erdogan, uh, that uh, the technique of amendments can also be used. Uh, 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 if Barbara were here, I would say in Hungary too, this technique was, uh, uh, was uh, uh, occasionally used both before and after the replacement. But in the Turkish case, it was only amendments that were used. Uh, I've written this in lots of places, so it's not so interesting. But obviously, uh, an amendment can be used to, to replace a whole constitution. If today, uh, in the uh, uh, proper uh, uh, procedure of US Article 5, uh, 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 Congress first, and then three quarters of the states would enact that uh, uh, that Adam Brown is the uh, the leader of the United States, uh, and his voice is law. Uh, that could be done, and that would be just a single amendment, the twenty sixth or twenty seventh. I'm not sure, twenty eighth. I think now in the United States, so an amendment can replace. Still, it is a different kind of thing because it is under the law the existing law and does not involve uh, uh, a new kind of highly legitimate process uh, in producing producing the constitution as in the case of constituent assembly so replacement amendment are two techniques unconstitutional statutes can be a technique too that's especially easy in the uk anybody here from the uk uh, no well too bad because you <laughs> need to hear this. Uh, your constitution exists. It's a series of statutes, uh, uh, precedents, uh, uh, and uh, customs. But any parliamentary act, a simple act, uh, which violates all of that, uh, could become the new constitution, unconstitutional statutes. Uh, for a while, this was made more difficult by the adherence of the UK to Europe where the European court be, could have uh, re rejected such an authoritarian statute of making, for example, Mr. Johnson, the leader uh, and Führer of, uh, of the United Kingdom. But today uh, that could be done. Now in other settings, of course, statutes can be reviewed, uh, can be reviewed by a court. There were lots of unconstitutional statutes passed in India, I don't know, Akansha and Udipta can count them out how many times your Supreme Court has made uh, uh, statutes on uh, statutes of, uh, of the parliament or for that matter, even the states unconstitutional, but it has been countless number of times in the US too. India, of course, makes me think that I'm forgetting something because the basic structure doctrine also says this could be done for an amendment. Uh, and in that sense, uh, you may need the cooperation, uh, the combination of B and D, C and D, to make B and C work. But D, what is D? Well, D is, is court packing. In other words, to make sure that you can amend the constitution in, uh, uh, in, Indian, in the Indian case, uh, or to pass unconstitutional statutes, uh, in let us say uh, uh, the United States, you need to control the court that has a chance to review these things. And so court packing becomes uh, a, fourth, a fourth fundamental technique. It's interesting how, uh, 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 let's take uh, an individual case uh, uh, of Colombia would be the best example of this. No one here from Colombia in this class. In the case of Colombia, all these techniques have been tried. In the Indian case, only B, C, and D. Uh, in uh, uh, the Hungarian case, uh, A, B, C, and D. In the Polish case, uh, Joanna, uh, only uh, C and D. Uh, but uh, that works uh, too in that particular instance. In other words, if you wanted to pass statutes as the current government uh, wished to uh, 
which went against the constitution of, 19, of 1997, uh, you needed to gain control of the court, which the government, it took them four years, I think, right? Correct me, Joanna, three or four years for the government to achieve that point, but now they have it. Of course, Mr. Kaczynski occasionally cries heavy tears that he would like to do what Orban did, and namely to create the constitution of the Fourth Republic. For him, symbolic reasons, D and E are not enough. Uh, I'm sorry, C and D together are, are not enough. He'd like to pass a new one. He wants to become the Pilsudski, if you want, of the new Poland. Or if you go back to, uh, 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 to the 18th century, King, what was his name? Uh, very famous one. Uh, eventually dying in exile, uh, uh, the Russians overthrow him. Uh, Augustus is part of his, uh, my Polish history is uh, getting rusty. If I haven't, uh, I haven't worked on it. But yes, there's a constitution passed even in the 18th century for the Polish kingdom. Uh, and so Kaczynski would like to be in the tradition of these, uh, uh, of these uh, founders and framers. Uh, but he cannot be because he has to win another election. He has to get two, unlike Mr. Orban, he has to get the required majorities in two chambers and he has to win a referendum too. Orban only had to win uh, the two thirds, the famous Hungarian two thirds in one chamber. But that depends on your constitution. In any case, these are the fundamental Technique you can see already in my outline. Why is there a heavy line between these points? I don't know. You can see the importance of being the government and not only in government to be able to practice these techniques, right? Uh, uh, because uh, unless you are uh, the government, uh, you cannot control. Uh, uh, you cannot control uh, the judiciary, uh, which uh, uh, has uh, a role for at least uh, uh, BC, uh, BC and uh, and D, because the court could also oppose its own packing. Uh, well, uh, these are the techniques, and you have had many populists in government, uh, right? Uh, it would be interesting to count count up. Uh, Latin America, of course, is going to win. There's no question, right? Uh, because you have had so many, uh, so many cases. Of course, it has to do also with the uh, the fragmentation uh, of uh, Hispanic culture in Latin America. And if you throw Brazil in, uh, Iberian culture in Latin America, you have a lot of cases. Uh, but it, it also has to do with the uh, the history, uh, which is somewhat similar. For example, revolutionary beginnings, except Brazil, revolutionary beginnings, the role of the military, uh, uh, the role of decentralization. Uh, you have had many chances for, and of course, Cadillism. I don't want to talk too much about this because people sometimes have a kind of political culture argument when you say Hispanic culture produces uh, Cadillism and populism. Uh, I don't want to accept that. But in any case, uh, certainly uh, uh, different kinds of uh, military leaders taking power uh, through sometimes coups and Trump's times plebiscites and sometimes their combination has happened uh, lots of times. So there are a lot of cases, uh, but there are now cases, uh, fortunately or unfortunately in Europe too, in government, because I said the importance of populism being in government uh, is key for the relationship uh, with, with populism. Uh, so without having done the empirical work, I have to say that uh, the logical argument uh, uh, does not in itself, does not in itself clinch uh, uh, the, the causal issue uh, and the empirical issue in terms of what the relationship to constitutionalism is going to be because the uh, the presence of populist, uh, of, of the presence of the interests of populist in constitutionalism and constitutions is 
is documentable for the big majority of cases, if not necessarily even all of them, and that is even possible. So what are the things that, uh, that uh, make the definition uh, uh, only a partial indication of what is likely to happen under populist rule? One question is that of constitutional inheritance. I was looking at Paul Taggart's work today because I think he is the reviewer of our book. And he uses this expression somewhere I've never seen anywhere else. Udipta might have seen it. Uh, populism as a chameleon. You know what a chameleon is. It's a little animal, I think also from Latin America, but correct me if, you, if I'm wrong in terms of my zoology. Of course, in zoos, they're everywhere because it's such a fantastic thing to see this little thing climb on a green leaf and become green and then climb into the yellow sand and become yellow. It's great. It's wonderful to watch this. But in any case, uh, uh, the metaphor is uh, adapting to your environment. And Taggart uh, probably has done much more empirical work on this than I have. He's probably right that populism picks up uh, many of the characteristics of where it finds itself. And that is uh, uh, going to lead to difference with respect to an important matter like constitutionalism. Or if you want, the constitutional inheritance will be different in different settings. And uh, uh, one has to adopt it. Uh, given the uh, the legal claims of populism, that constitutional inheritance can become rigid. That's what I just said in the case of the Pol Poland, where uh, you'd like to get rid of it because the Third Republic, who the hell, what the hell was the Third Republic? It's a red and pink, red and pink bargain, right? Uh, I'm paraphrasing sometimes what, what Kaczynski, both Kaczynskis used to say, uh, uh, but still, uh, uh, we're legally minded people. We're Poles after all, we're not uh, Peruvians, uh, a Pole might say, or we're not Spaniards or we're not French. Uh, uh, we, we are legal, we're legalistic uh, uh, minded. And so uh, uh, we are caught by this thing and, and we have to adapt itself, at least adapt to this thing formally. Oh, well, in any case, they have so far, what would stop them from declaring a revolutionary break? Well, the Polish people might stop them. <laughs> I think <laughs> there is a certain amount of sign, and I have to talk about this later on in the course, that populism produces also forms of protest and forms of resistance. We've seen this in Poland just now, in fact, and uh, there is a university occupation going on in Hungary. Uh, so it's not only a Polish Poles, of course, we all know are very rebellious people uh, to going against what I said before about legality. And maybe in Poland, you can't risk the emergence of yet another solidarity. In any case, uh, there are limits. And these limits have to do with my second issue, legitimacy. That legitimacy is what blocks internal oppositions from forming. Moreover, there is also external legitimacy which in the case of Poland and Hungary matters because within the European Union, uh, there are also uh, possible things that the Europeans can do. I'm watching uh, because I have very little else to do for my entertainment, Occupied, which is a uh, Netflix uh, uh, imagined story about the occupation of Nor uh, Norway by Russia. Uh, and in that, uh, uh, in that particular story, uh, the European Union plays a very important role in whether that occupation can continue or not. Uh, uh, that means that for countries like Hungary, Poland, uh, uh, legitimacy externally also matters. And this is a factor also in Latin America, uh, even though the OAS is not as powerful as the EU, and of course the World Bank and, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, International Monetary Fund could also come into the picture uh, under some uh, uh, violations of aspects of constitutionalism. Uh, so internal and external legitimacy matter. Also a question of alliances, which I very much think mattered for Mr. Morales, who I certainly see as a figure uh, uh, 
to have a populist idea of his own leadership. Uh, nevertheless, the indigenous movement was not just one movement, but several. And the coca growers were a labor union linked to other labor unions. So to win an election and to come to power, the Maas uh, or Morales had to depend on allies who then had a voice in the constituent process. And indeed, uh, 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 given their voice, the liberals too, uh, liberal Democrats got into the constituent assemblies and then they got a voice as well. So uh, the question of alliances, I mentioned the resistance, already uh, already matter. But there are also countervailing uh, tendencies uh, once uh, you are in power. One such countervailing tendency is all the promises you made which are violated. Populists come to power maybe with thin ideologies, but they make promises to uh, their voters uh, everywhere about what they're going to do for them. Uh, I'm sure that Cesar can tell you uh, exactly what Fujimori promised to the so-called precariat, which you said in the class is 70% of the population and perhaps uh, a lesser percentage of the electorate, but still a significant part. Promises were made, but does the neoliberal policy of Fujimori able to deliver? In this sense, uh, Orban and Kaczynski are cleverer because they combine left and right promises to different constituencies. You've seen this also in Trump, uh, even though he delivered very little for, uh, for his subaltern uh, constituency, but he does deliver them cultural goods. The culture war is what he gives many of them. He gives uh, 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 economics to the oligarchs and culture war to the masses. But he lost anyway, so it didn't work. But you can see, uh, you can see uh, my point. Uh, when promises are violated, then uh, then those to whom promises were made can rebel. That's less true for oligarchs, who, after all, cannot easily go out uh, and organize mass demonstrations and overthrows. Although in Latin America they could use the military for that purpose sometimes. But there is also the promises made to the population, and they can do a populism on you, or even a democratic uh, 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 form of resistance. Remember, United States, after Trump's election, something called the resistance emerged, playing a significant role in lots of parts of the country. My daughter was an activist in Missouri, uh, playing a significant role uh, in the outcome of the election of 2018, which then prepared the 2020 outcome, even though it was a little bit reversed. So resistance is a problem. And uh, one of the things you can do in the case of resistance is to repress. And so in that sense, constitutionalism, even your own constitution that you have created under the impact of external and internal uh, uh, constraints can become a problem. Uh, and so uh, 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 repression, uh, uh, happens in lots of populist settings uh, to different extents. Some of them suppress all newspapers. And you can see why that is functional because if the people don't know that you haven't fulfilled your promise or they think you only didn't deliver to you personally, but you delivered to everybody else, which is what the governmental media is gonna claim, you can't really establish solidarity with those who are also victims. As long as there's a free press, free communications, and in the internet today, that is something that is difficult to repress, uh, then of course uh, uh, you are endangered. But still repression can take another form like jailing opponents, uh, uh, like excluding people from the uh, uh, electoral participation. Venezuela, uh, certainly uh, uh, this, this has happened. And the two issues finally, which you have to solve, uh, which weirdly enough, even as you're attacking the remnants of liberal constitutionalism, bring you back to constitutionalism. Uh, in Latin America, the main issue was re-eligibility. I don't know empirically if this has been an issue in every single Latin American country. I don't know, even Cesar can tell me, 
if does every Latin American country has term limits for the president or did at one time? He says no, uh, but probably not the majority- Not at all, not at all. <laughs> okay, but the majority did have uh, such limits. Yeah. And, and if you have the populist self-understanding and you are the voice of the people, then re-eligibility becomes uh, not only uh, bad for you personally, but manifestly unfair. How can you deprive the people on whose behalf you've been speaking for four years or eight, in the case of two terms, to vote for you again? I mean, uh, to create a pluri national republic in Bolivia, how can you do that in four years or eight? It takes a long time to really change things, not just in, on paper, but in reality. So you gotta remain in power to be able to do it. I'm speaking now for Mr. Morales, uh, who ran into very specific difficulties in this effort, but this happens to populist leaders who do not yet have all of the government, like Uribe in Colombia. It happened certainly to Chavez, uh, 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 and, uh, and I'm sure there are many other cases that people can point to where uh, constitutional change of your own constitution, which you have made yourself or helped to make yourself, is put on the agenda. Because uh, in the complement of virtue to vice, you still put in re-eligibility. Why did Morales do it? Why did Chavez do it? Could they, couldn't they have avoided it? Yes, they could have avoided it. But in Venezuela and in Bolivia, you always had it. In Bolivia, he had other forces to contend with who insisted on it. Chavez, I'm not so sure. So you still put in two terms. It's never been three terms, interestingly enough. Even in the US, we have two terms. Uh, it's said about Bill Clinton, who is not much of a populist, he hated the two terms. Presidents don't like it. No president likes it, especially if they're relatively young. I think Joe Biden doesn't care. Right? Joe Biden's case, a third term. Uh, well, he's going to be in his late 80s. Uh, it's not a big issue. He has to think about the second term still, whether he can even do it. And he just announced that he's interested. You see the bug, you're in power and you feel you want to remain and you want to do things. And in Biden's case, I hate to say it, I support that because to overcome the Republican sabotage, <laughs> two years are not gonna be enough and four probably also not. You need a bunch of elections. Roosevelt went into this just for that reason. Now he, tended to be as close to an American uh, plebiscitary leader as we had, but still uh, he was supported by lots of forces in the Democratic Party who were oligarchic and so on. And labor unions too, who were independent uh, forces in American society back then. And he has his conflicts with them too. Uh, so re-eligibility becomes a problem and populists attack their own constitution because of that. And then finally, the electoral rule is a problem because you want to win the next election. And you won under the existing electoral rule because a huge mobilization occurred. But what happens when your promises are disappointed? Then the old electoral rule won't do. Why does Viktor Orban that gets two thirds uh, in 2010 change the electoral rule anyway? Because he's a very smart guy and he knows it's not gonna be enough for both potential constitutional changes and for being reelected. And then he wins again under the new electoral rule twice, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, even your own constitution has to be uh, a target. In this sense, populist constitutionalism becomes a relatively unstable uh, uh, achievement, even if it is achieved in the first place. I stopped with this, as you can see from my outline. I return to some of these questions uh, uh, next time. You can, of course, uh, 
uh, have this outline uh, then when I have fully developed it. But before then, I will send you the, the book chapter or chapter five, which goes through all these matters uh, in some detail and the cases will be discussed there. So I'm going to uh, uh, open up the floor, the floor to you, but I saw David's hand. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, so I recently read for a different class, uh, Sheldon Wolin's uh, Fugitive Democracy. And his one of his major claims was that there was an antagonistic tension between constitutionalism and democracy itself. Um, and obviously it's not exactly the same as, as populism and constitutionalism, but I was wondering what your thoughts were there uh, between the relationship and how it tied into this conversation. Very terrific. Of course, I read his book a very long time ago, but I know what his positions were. He's a radical Democrat, a critic of American democracy, and thinks in many ways it has produced an oligarchic order. Hard to deny, you know, the leading political science theory of Joseph Schumpeter used to call our type of democracy elite democracy. Now, this is even said on their side, right? Not only on Wolin's side, but on the side of the of the of the elite Democrats. Now, what produces it, how it is possible, is a big topic here. It, it is, it's such a crucial question, right? Would I call Sheldon Wolin a populist? In the United States, everybody is, you know. Uh, as long as they uh, they want good things for uh, for most people, they're populists. Uh, even Krugman, who's a wonderful economist, earned his Nobel Prize, writes essays where where he uh, he he messes, you know, he he uses such an expansive definition, or not even a definition, but pre understanding of populism. I don't know how Sheldon Rowland's attitude to American populism was, but to me, he's a radical Democrat. And a radical Democrat uh, who criticizes uh, 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 not just the oligarchic aspect, but as you yourself just now put it, uh, the judicialization of American politics, that the oligarchy as it is, is enforced and reinforced by uh, by what, for example, uh, 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 one Israeli author uh, 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 has called juristocracy. Uh, it's not a term that Sheldon Wollen used there, but I refer to gouvernement des juges of 19th century concept. Uh, so, uh, of course, the American party system itself, along with the way we do elections, is oligarchy. The role of money in American politics also has oligarchy consequences. So to blame oligarchy only on the Supreme Court and the way it is appointed, uh, there are moments where Franklin Roosevelt may have thought so, because that's the only limit that he ran into at a certain point in trying to create an American welfare state. Although, what is the reality? The reality is he has Southern Democrats on his neck too. Those who know the history will know that a lot of the compromises are made uh, because the Southern Democrats would not vote uh, for anything. So Roosevelt doesn't take on civil rights. He, he had not a racist bone in his body, right? Or at least, uh, uh, you know, uh, what was not culturally uh, at that moment uh, universal among the white part of the population. Uh, he's not a racist, uh, really, given the standards of the time, or even probably newer standards. But he makes concessions to these people, and the Jim Crow system is not touched. Uh, so in that sense, the, and of course, Jim Crow is oligarchic by its very nature, right? I mean, right? I mean, if African Americans who are near majority in lots of states can't vote at all, that's oligarchic. And that's what the Republicans try to restore now. But it's true that the courts play a role in it, and Roosevelt faced them. And he tried to pack them. And I think that this is a significant factor. Now, is, does this mean a fundamental tension? Because I'm staying with you, David, a fundamental and even irresolvable tension between democracy and constitutionalism. 
I don't know if it ever showed in Volan's view. Uh, it could have been, could have been. Well, what would that mean? That we could have a pure democracy without constitutional restraints at all. Now, there are people who imagine that after uh, 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 relatively superficial readings of Aristotle, right? Because he is the one who introduces democracy as a systematic matter. Well, Plato did it before, but only in a ne aggressive way. Uh, but even, even for uh, Athens, if you go back and forget about the exclusions involved, we would say that there were traditional restraints within which the, the citizens acted. The death of Socrates indicates uh, how important those traditional restraints still were, uh, right? And so the idea of no constitutionalism uh, for a democracy which has to operate under some procedures is almost unimaginable. But of course, that doesn't yet solve the question because uh, should those rules uh, limit uh, 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 the demos uh, 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 in a fundamental way or even only in a temporary and revisable way. And I think a Democrat is gonna have to say the second. In other words, whatever those limits are, they're changeable. But even this is a puzzle and the judges of the uh, a basic structure doctrine in India had to face the puzzle uh, uh, because uh, 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 shouldn't there be at least some eternal normative principles? In Germany, they are called eternity clauses. They are put into the constitution. Nehru and Ambedkar did not put these into the Indian constitution. Nevertheless, the judges said they're there. We see them, amazing moment. Uh, 1970s, uh, but it is influencing constitutional development in Latin America. The replacement doctrine in Colombia uh, is a takeoff from the basic structure doctrine. And you can see that there's a problem and the Indian judges are the ones you have to confront Sheldon Wallen with. Could we, through a democratic vote, abolish the, all the freedoms of a table of rights. I mean, technically, why not? But what would happen to the democracy itself if that happens? Uh, so I think that there is a way of making this argument which stays short of populism. But populists will go further than I think Sheldon Buller would have gone and insist on majority rule it, on, on ultimately all issues, majority rule uh, as, uh, 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 as embodied by whoever the majority elects. But this is a really fundamental question and you know, no one has ever solved it. The German uh, uh, constitution makers, uh, at Kimse, that was the place where they met after the Second World War. Weimar is, is the other thing. But Kimse, the German constitution makers, thought that it's so important not to allow Hitler to happen again that they wrote eternity clauses. Eternity clauses having to do with fundamental rights. But they wrote in human dignity too. And that gives a lot of power to a court. You know, freedom of speech, we can more or less operationalize what it means. Freedom of press also. We can make laws that allow it, but at the same time, uh, uh, limit it in some uh, uh, way as to avoid criminality on the part of the speaker, for example. Hate speech, that's a question. Should it be limited? But when it comes to human dignity, that gives the judges a lot of power. I don't know what Sheldon Wollum would have thought of it, but I think he had to think it was a bad idea to write in human dignity as an unchangeable eternity clause of the, of the Grundgesetz.
Wow, I'm answering your question for 15 minutes here, David. But believe me, this is the most fundamental question of constitutional law. And, you know, talking about German and Indian judges, it makes it a universal problem. And Colombian, because they're the third attempt of Uribe, or rather the attempt of Uribe to get himself a third term. The judges, interestingly enough, said a second term. Yeah, well, you got a pretty good idea, pretty good argument, Uribe, because the people can't stop, be stopped from reelecting a successful president. His success had to do with the FARC and his attempts to suppress the FARC. Uh, and so he would have been reelected. But then the same Uribe wanted a third term. And he wasn't doing that great with the FARC by then. But in any case, the same judges, I don't know if identical, the same person, but the same court says, no, no, two terms, that's the right of the people to reelect. Three terms is an abuse. And the replacement doctrine said that a third term cannot be, cannot be allowed. It's really interesting, right? Because it's the judges who decided. Uh, and Chavez ran into this three problem of three also. And Morales too. You know, once you're doing these things, you think it's never enough. Okay, so David. Thank you. Thank you. No, really, I mean... Uh, uh, it's Andreas, right? Uh, and you mm -hmm. together uh, is that he assigns these things, you read them, and then you see the relationship of the two courses. That's called, you know, in quotation marks, education, right? That's what we do here, right? That's what we're supposed to be doing. Anybody else? I have a very, very different question. Um... <laughs> That's uh, fine. Ten minutes or so of your lecture, um, and about the linkage between populists to their, to their own constitution. Um, and we spoke a lot about the, the change of the constitution in terms of content um, and what it can allow. Um, but I'm curious if you could speak to the way in which the constitution may be claimed by populists as being their own, um, and if there are modifications made by populists to constitution that perhaps don't change the content but change the form or language or appearance of the constitution to appear as though it is this new creation by a new leader. So I'm thinking almost of something analogous to how Trump signed the uh, stimulus checks with his name and changed the appearance of something to link it to the image of the populist, populist leader without changing the content of the actual thing at hand. Well, you know, there's a lot of interesting aspects to what you ask, and and you're asking about the content of constitutions. I'm going to return to that, but then you took the question in another direction, namely the symbolic uh, 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 impact of it. I mean, you run into a problem uh, when your name is not George Washington in the United States, or at least uh, uh, to the more knowledgeable James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, right? You're not really them. You don't look like them. You don't act like them. <laughs> you don't have the culture. <laughs> I'm sure even George Washington, who was a soldier eventually, but he was, you can't compare him even to Trump. This is a real, this is an elite of the old type. So for Trump to put himself in the place of these people by a signature is impossible. And it becomes important. That's why I mentioned Kaczynski. Uh, Kaczynski a much brighter person than Trump. And of course, uh, uh, he was a solidarity leader, uh, not a faction which I particularly liked, uh, but nevertheless, uh, Joanna can correct me if I'm getting this wrong. He was a significant figure in Valencia circles, uh, more on the right, more on the nationalist side and on the democratic side. Okay, fine, uh, but he was, he had real merits, he and his twin brother. And so in that sense, uh, uh, he doesn't even have to be prime minister or president uh, to have a kind of symbolic relationship to the, uh, to the government now. Uh, Trump doesn't even have that. So in a way, putting your signature on is a, uh, a pathetic affirmation of your point. 
but it is a pathetic one, right? I mean, you know, uh, Joe Biden now already said, I'm not putting my signature on these. That's more like Washington, by the way, in temperament, right? I don't want to glorify the guy, but not putting your name on it is what George Washington would have done too. You know, if you really, if people really associate you with something, you don't have to do the, you know, the monkey business, this, this stuff. But, but the point is right, there's a symbolic aspect. And that symbolic aspect, I think, can be satisfied in today's world by either making a new constitution, you know, uh, pretty soon in Hungary, if this basic law survives, one is gonna call it Orban's basic law. I mean, it wouldn't have happened without him. And though he didn't write it, it is said that Joseph Sire, who is another Fidesz reader, wrote it on an iPad, uh, traveling to Brussels from Budapest and back. I think it's a joke. I don't believe it. Sire once lectured to us at Cardozo Law School here. And he's not a great guy, but he's at least uh, 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 a relatively uh, 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 intelligent one who would not attempt to write a constitution all on his own for a party and for a leader where there are different groups and factions who have to also uh, put in their two cents. But what they did in that case already is to write a, a highly nationalistic preamble. That's the place where the symbolic is. Lots of things in that constitution remain what was ordered in 89, 90. Uh, but the preamble is different. That's what Kaczynski would love, to be able to write a preamble for the Fourth Republic. I don't know the guy, Joanna. So if I'm attributing something to him, maybe I'm wrong. But I'm kind of imagining him, right? I'm imagining uh, uh, Lech Kaczynski. And, you know, he's not, is he a lawyer by training? Probably not. So he would have to farm out the actual task to a team. You know, it's not one person on an iPad. It's got to be 30, 40 people representing different issues, different things. What about the interest of farmers? What about the interest of union? You know, all this has to go in. But the preamble, maybe you can write. Maybe Sire, uh, in, in Hungarian we pronounce SZ, the reverse from Polish. So we say Sire, they would say Shire, but it's the same German originally name. Uh, Sire maybe wrote the preamble. Although perhaps Orban had a voice in that because that was a big point in making Hungary into a, uh, an ethnic, more ethnically Hungarian and Christian polity. And that's the symbolic. It doesn't change the, the relationship of judges to uh, legislature, which they changed in the end also. It doesn't change the prime minister's mode of appointment, which is still through a constructive no confidence vote, but it makes the identity of the polity somehow different on a symbolic level. So your point is of course right. Now, as an aside to your point, uh, populists use uh, are uh, linked to different coalitions. I say this in my piece, which I'm gonna send you guys, uh, uh, sometimes write in what their partners want. All the direct democratic elements and plurinationalism, which are in the Bolivian constitution, are the, uh, are the, are the popular movements who are supporting MAS. Uh, maybe Morales uh, fully agreed with them uh, on these points, but the reason they're in. On the other hand, uh, the liberal limits are put in because the liberals have a voice in the end also. Uh, so, uh, so the content are not going to be just what the populists would like. What would a populist constitution be according to the logical, uh, 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 according to the logical uh, uh, scheme that I set up? This is going to be extremely polemical. I'm going to say that it would be the Führer principe, except that Führer needs to be reelected every six, seven years. That would be a pure populist constitution according to my logic. So what is the Führer Prinzip for those who don't know German or who are lucky not to know that history? It is the leadership principle. 
but the leader has to be re-elected. Uh, and that would be a pure uh, uh, populist constitution. If Poland writes one like that, you can be sure of being kicked out of the European Union. If Hungary writes one like that, you're out of the European Union very quickly. The European Parliament is going to demand that the uh, Council uh, apply, I don't know which article of the, of, the, of the Charter or the treaty, in that case, the treaty, and expel you. So you can't do that. Uh, maybe <laughs> Johnson could do it in England because they're out now. Uh, and if he wanted a revolution on the streets of London and Manchester and Birmingham, that's what he would do. Give Britain a written constitution which says, whatever Boris says is law. Uh, uh, and uh, the only limit is that Boris has to be reelected every six years. Imagine that would be a truly revolutionary moment in, in, in the history of the United Kingdom if anybody attempted that kind of thing. He wouldn't imagine it, of course, because he likes the fact that it's unwritten. But he has a problem, right? Because parliamentary elections could elect Labour or the Labour and the Scots together or who knows who else. So in fact, he has potentially a constitution like the populists would like to write, but this electoral thing is, is what distinguishes it from a purely authoritarian state. Okay, two great questions, very long answers, but it's your fault because I, I will answer long if the questions are so good. Anybody else? We have still about 10 minutes. I have a follow up, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, sure. At one point, you noted this. Uh, you know, when when they're making the constitution, if they were more, if they were better, they would have had thirty to forty people sitting in a room with all these diverse interests. It wouldn't be on an iPad. Um, that struck me as potentially also having symbolic relevance. Do we see among populists an attempt to rehearse the original constitution making event? Um, does that part of the Constitution too become symbolic? I'm thinking of the way in which, like, an American populist could say something like, you know, we went back to the to the room where George Washington, you know, did this. Or I, I accept what you're saying about the preamble as the focus of of the symbolic within the Constitution, but I, I'm trying to understand if there's also a, a rehearsal of an event or a rehearsal of a set of practices that could also be symbolic. Or do you think there's a significant drop off between well, the preamble and everything else? Well, no, no, no. Look, I mean, this is also a good, very good question. Um, it, it, one question leads to the other. So I start with the, I start backwards. Uh, you know, the US Constitution does what you said. It establishes Article 5. I mean, you can look it up in five seconds, which has the possibility for calling a new convention. And this time they say it's going to have to be three quarters of the states uh, that will have to ratify also possibly through their own conventions. So it's, it's, there is a possibility of, of the reenactment of the uh, original constitutional making process in the United States. Uh, there are Latin American constitutions, usually the four stage ones, which for important matters have that kind of level. If you want to change the basic structure, then you're going to have to have a, a new constituent assembly and then a referendum and whatever it is that each country does. So constitutions do this. Even the Grundgesetz did it in its uh, article, I think, uh, 146, where uh, uh, it uh, 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 allowed for the possibility uh, if Germany is reunited to have a new constitution making process such as the original one. Um, Germany also had an article 27 which allowed the amendment of the existing basic law, but it had to do it within the limits which I already mentioned, uh, fundamental rights and, the, and human dignity. But uh, 
uh, it's not clear whether those limits would even apply to a new convention. So constitutions do what Adam demanded of them. They uh, leave room for, for redoing it. And this is a fundamentally uh, a democratic idea because why, who is the, uh, uh, the prophet of this? Thomas Jefferson. Why should this freedom be available only to one generation? Each generation should have the opportunity. He had, more radically, uh, along with Condorcet in France, the possibility of every generation having a new constitution making process. Of course, every generation doesn't really work because people are born at different times. So usually it is 30 years. Every 30 years, you'll make a new one. So this is Jefferson's proposal. It is uh, adopted in a modified form, uh, adopted in a modified form by those amendment rules that I mentioned. So this is part of your question, but the other part of your question it, it relates to the popular character of it, which is of course what we should be talking about in a course on populism, the popular character. Because in the US, uh, even though the convention was not elected, uh, the ratifying conventions of the states were to be uh, newly elected. That was a rule made by the convention. They could not be the legislatures themselves already in place. They had to be newly elected for the purpose of ratification. And this meant that uh, uh, the founding fathers, I hate the term because fathers, why not mothers? Well, there weren't any women among them, but okay, the founding fathers, it's such a quaint uh, Americanism to refer. We have the term framers, that's better. The framers, uh, uh, the framers uh, 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 wanted uh, uh, to let the people back in. And at that time, the people were in 13 states. It was not a national people. The constitution was to form a national people. So the peoples of the states in the plural were to be let back in. And that's, that was a fundamental democratic idea. Now, how many times was this repeated, this founding event in that sense in the United States? The answer is zero. The older 26, 27 amendments were made through uh, 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 the legislative route by the by Congress and by the existing state legislatures. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the convention formula, even for ratification, was never used. It could have been one or two instances where it was. I leave out the Reconstruction when this was really uh, uh, in turmoil. But one could say that uh, that the Latin American constitution makers who make new ones. Uh, let the people back in uh, in a more systematic way than the U.S. makers ever did by creating these four-tier amendment rules where anything really important can be changed uh, only through doing it again. Chavez manipulated this. He first asked for, this is what the populist does. It takes a democratic idea and manipulates it in a weird way. How did he manipulate it? Well, he had to do his third re-election on the highest tier. They did a constitution with four levels of change in it. So he had to do it on the highest tier, which meant what? A referendum on it. He had to have a referendum. It wasn't state conventions. That's the U.S. thing. In other countries, it's a referendum that is used for that purpose. So a referendum after extensive discussion in the press and all the rest was held. And guess what? He lost by 6,000 votes. Cesar, do you, uh, well, you're probably not alive at the time, you're too young. So, uh, so uh, Hugo Chavez lost by 6,000 votes. So what did he say? Well, it was a big package of constitutional changes that he lost. He said, separability, it's a legal concept. You could take out three eligibility from the package of 30, put it into a package of five, and pass it through Congress, a lower level of change, not the highest, but uh, a second or third, I'm not sure which one now. And this then went to the court because could you do this trick? Uh, 
on the Venezuelan people. This was called by some people to be an internal coup against the constitution, against his own constitution. Could he do it? Well, he already packed the court and the court said, sovereignty, Venezuelan people could not be denied by, uh, 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 by a mere procedure like an amendment rule. You see, the, the democratic element can be brought in. Colombia has a 40 rule too, not just Venezuela. That can be done in a non-populist setting. The democratic element can be included, but the populist is never good enough. It's never good enough to them because it's not the amendment rule that reveals the identity of the people. It's his body that reveals that identity. That's, that's the problem here. Now, of course, could a populist break with that and obey the law? Yes, Indira Gandhi did it in India. She did it. She lost elections. She left. It, you know, just because uh, you're a populist leader in some respects doesn't mean you have to go all the way. And she was clever because she was then reelected one time after. I can't you correct me if I got that wrong, uh, but I think it's one election after. Uh, or Redipta, if I got it wrong. Uh, now, of course, uh, the unfortunate lady was then murdered uh, because of another thing. India has a lot of internal tensions which are not on democracy against non-democracy, but they have to do with other things. And in this case, it had to do with the Golden Temple, which she, crazily enough, invaded. I mean, you know. Uh, I don't know what they were planning in the Golden Temple, at least what she thought they were planning, but attacking a religious shrine is rarely a great idea. And she did it. And that cost her her life. But she, democratic enough, the daughter of Nehru, right? Democratic enough. You can't break with the father if the father is... Constitution can break with him enough by keeping yourself in power. I think one of her sons told her, there's a way, let's make this presidential. And that was Sanjay, right? Sanjay Gandhi. I always confuse Sanjay and Rajiv. Sanjay Gandhi. His view was you could make it presidential and then run directly with no re-eligibility problem. She refused. My father and his friends made a parliamentary system. I don't know if that's what she said. There are biographies of her, I'm sure, which discuss this. But it is a dramatic moment because she left power after an election. Maduro only thought of new tricks. The Constituent Assembly that doesn't even make a constitution was his trick. Cesar, yes, your hand is up. Yeah, I only have a question about uh, you were discussing in this outline uh, the different uh, concerns about the trans the, the possibility of a populist constitutionalism, and you mentioned that it is uh, very important uh, not only to be in government but also uh, to handle it in a powerful uh, way to think about this issue. But uh, I was wondering also what is the important in, in these different cases that we uh, that you were uh, reviewing uh, in Europe or in Latin America or even in uh, other experiences, uh, 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 how uh, the, there is a previous, uh, pre there are previous triggers as the existence of weak political institutions, for instance. Uh, I don't know, uh, it, it would be the case that it is important. I mean, that populist leaders also handle the democratic, uh, 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 how can I say this? The democratic motives of uh, peoples which are not represented, but also uh, there is uh, the case that in some, uh, uh, experiences, uh, the judiciary is not working good, or the uh, parliament is uh, 
not functional. So uh, it, it would be also important to consider these issues. Well, uh, of course, uh, 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 all the issues you mentioned are highly relevant. You can't just, uh, through a lucky election, uh, Donald Trump, obviously, you can't just uh, arrive in Washington and say, well, I'm going to change now Washington's, well, Madison's and uh, Hamilton's uh, 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 and John Marshall's constitution, right? Uh, and there are a lot of things wrong with the US constitution today. There are people write books on this. Uh, uh, Sanford Levinson uh, has a book of this type, What is Wrong with the US Constitution? Dahl has a book uh, on this too. Those are the only two books I can think of. But there are many people who, who write about this. And of course, these days we all say the Electoral College, the way we do elections, uh, uh, the way we, uh, you know, we kind of create incentives for a pure two-part system with all its exclusions and many other things. And even the way we appoint the court, the topic I discussed today, you know, to make it a kind of political football and make the court in that sense uh, uh, an instrument in somebody's political uh, agenda, whether a person is in power or out of power. So there's plenty wrong. And that's what Jefferson would have predicted that there will be, after a while, plenty wrong with all constitutions. So I think that the one issue that you may, you say is that, that, of course, some constitutions can work worse than others, which is your point. And, and changing them becomes even more necessary and demanding, not just because of the issue of democracy, but because of, of poor functioning. Uh, that could have been the case uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, a lot of the Andean republics uh, uh, also uh, uh, before the populists. And it is not only populists who want to make these changes. Usually lawyers uh, want to make these changes because they don't want to see them, uh, see them the earliest. Uh, uh, so here is, uh, so, so that's of course part of it. If, if, if nothing like that is perceived, but you elect a populist leader because of a pure policy uh, promise, which has nothing to do with the constitution, then it's not easy to, you know, Boris Johnson had not said, I'm going to make a new constitution uh, and Trump uh, never would have imagined. Of course, he, he couldn't have since he doesn't even know what it is that we have. Uh, so it doesn't, you know, uh, it's not automatic that they enter into this world. But my thesis is that a constitution that restrains becomes eventually a problem for them, a roadblock. A roadblock. And in those cases, the conflict emerges for another reason than necessarily the built in problems. Now, there could be something, could be both a built in problem and a roadblock, in which case the populace will get more support for changing that thing because it's not just their roadblock, it's everybody's roadblock. Okay, so that's part of the uh, part of the answer. The other thing that you mentioned is institutionalization. Some poorly institutionalized regimes. Commonly, it is said that Peruvian uh, democracy is poorly institutionalized. So uh, I'm not too surprised that you you say that. And there is a theory of populism. Uh, Valand, I think, uh, uh, and Barr uh, are the ones who uh, who use this, who actually make it almost definitional is that populism is a democratic option under purely poorly institutionalized regimes, which uh, exclude people, not because of oligarchy, which is one possibility, but because of poor institutionalization. There are so many parties in Peru, no one is represented. You come to power and there's no way of making inputs into it because you don't even know who is ruling. Uh, right, so that kind of issue. Uh, someone could say, well, we need uh, the big majority to be represented, not only these 20 different factions, groups, we need to mobilize the majority. And so that becomes a possibility for populist mobilization in some of these theories. And of course, if that is the way it's happening, the constitution could be blamed for the uh, lack of institutionalization. The reason why Peru is so disorganized is because uh, 
uh, whoever it was uh, that created uh, the constitution before three mores. Uh, I, I think it was done after the restoration of democracy, or maybe they went back to an earlier one from the 1940s. I think they did. No, they made a new one after restoration of democracy. Okay, I you know my so many Latin American countries. My knowledge of each of the histories uh, is 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 mixed, but in any case. Uh, the lack of institutionalization subsequently could be blamed on that. So a new constitution, Fujimori has a point. But you can't do it because the bad institutionalized framework checkmates constitutional, normal constitutional change by amendment, Alberto Fujimori would say. And so I had to get rid of them. Who's the them? The Congress and the courts. The Otogolpe gets rid of the existing constitutional structures. He was elected, he remains in place. That's the auto, right? That's the self part of the coup. He remains in place, but it is not that he's there alone. It's, it's the supporters who uh, enable him to do this. You can't just go and, uh, Trump might have loved to do this, uh, to get rid of the House of Representatives uh, 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 presided over by Nancy Pelosi. Uh, well, they tried a little bit, <laughs> something like that. It was pathetic. So the difference between Trump's uh, caricature of an autogolpe and Fujimori's autogolpe is the fact that Fujimori does have that uninstitutionalized mass support, which has genuine grievances with respect to how representation was working in Peru. That's the answer. Uh, it's a long answer again, but you had two questions in one, basically, which you fused. Uh, yes, there are real problems with constitutions, and that means we should keep constitutional uh, renovation open. Thomas Jefferson, 101, right? Uh, and then uh, uh, the other thing is that sometimes the problems with constitutions are, uh, are oligarchic representation, that's the cartel party version. And sometimes uh, lack of institutionalized representation for the majority. And in either case, you can mobilize people uh, to, to attack the regime and behind constitutional replacement. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is probably time uh, I love your questions in this class. I mean, they are really so incredible, which of course is the point of this, right? I mean, that's what we're doing here. It's not for me to talk, 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 even though I do a lot of it, but for you to uh, want to come up with these questions. Uh, so next time uh, we continue with this, let's begin with your questions next time.